Good afternoon, this is Tim Gleisner from the Library of Michigan. I'm head of collections. I'm here today with Michigan Notable Book Award winner of 2020, Susie Finkbeiner. Uh, her book, All Manner of Things by Ravel Press, uh, was published in the last year and was selected by the Notable Book Committee. Um, we would like to uh, just allow anyone the chance, if they are so desiring, to contact the Library of Michigan Foundation um, for any support they would like to give in the future to the, library, the Michigan Notable Book Program in the Library of Michigan. And with that, I'd like to say, welcome, Susie Finkbeiner. How are you today? Great. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome, and, and, and thank you for being here on this lovely and hot day in the afternoon. Um, so, you know, Susie, I, I begin these interviews with the, the same question. I would just like you to give us a little background and maybe leading us into how you became a writer. What got you to this point? You know, I've always been obsessed with story. Um, I come from a storytelling family. I come from a family that has several writers. And so it was very natural for me to kind of slip into this career as a writer. Um, in fact, when people take reasonable jobs in my family, we're like, what? <laughs> but um, I, I started writing at a very young age and, and I just love it. And so when I became an adult, I would write plays for my church because we had no budget. And so I would write the plays, and then a friend dared me to write a novel. Wow. And I said, that's what crazy people do. And it, it is a little bit maddening to write a novel, but um, I wrote my first novel, and I was hooked, absolutely hooked. So this, this wasn't your first novel, and I apologize for not knowing that. So what was no. your first novel about? What was... Uh... Um, <laughs> if I may ask. Novel, yeah. if I may ask. My first novel, it, re it released in 2013, and it's called Paint Chip. It's about, it's set in Michigan. I only have one novel that's not set in Michigan. No. And um, <laughs> that one, it, it deals with um, sex trafficking and grief and loss. It's got a lot of issues in it. Okay. So, um, yeah. It was very timely at that time because, I mean, sex trafficking was definitely in the news at that time. I remember that for sure. Yeah, yeah. At the time, I was I was working with some of the anti-trafficking organizations in Grand Rapids. Okay, okay. So tell me, um, why do you write? And, and I guess, you know, actually, just to go back to your background, so you're a native of Michigan. Where are you from in Michigan originally? I was born and raised in Lansing. Oh, really? Okay. In the south side. I'm a south side. Outside of Lansing. Okay, very good. What school did you go to? Lansing Christian. Lansing Christian. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why do you write? Why do you feel compelled to write? What is it about writing that helps you or, or what gets, you know, what is it that, that compels you to write? Well, contracts, that compels me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <That helps>. also, <laughs> it does. Um, I really process the world, I process my emotions, I process life through story. And so it's cathartic in one way for me to write. And, and also I write because I know that when I read a book that I identify with and that reaches into my, my heart and really touches my emotions, I, I know how, how great of an experience that can be. And so if I can provide that in even a small way to a reader, that's, that's gold to me. It's worth all of the three o'clock writing in the morning writing sessions and all the tearing out of the hair, all of it. It's worth all of it. Okay, so a catharsis. So you talk about 3 a.m. sessions. How often are you writing? Like, what is there a routine that you have or just when the spirit grabs you? Like, how often do you think you're writing? I write every day. I except the weekends. I try to take the weekends off nice. um, just because you have to have that rest and, and break for your brain. I used to write every single day and I realized I wasn't allowing myself to, to refresh with, with, you know, just having nothing on my mind, reading, spending time with my family, but five days a week, usually when the kids are at school, but 
they haven't been at school much lately. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Yeah, so it's been um, it's been a different a different schedule the past few weeks. And in fact, I was up until three o'clock in the morning last night because right as I headed to bed, I I thought, oh, if I don't write this idea down, it's it's gone. Um, I don't have the luxury of writing only when I'm inspired. Sure. Uh, but, but I think that, that if I sit down, if I make myself available, the inspiration does come eventually. Okay. Can I ask, um, so are you always working on the same piece then due to your contracts or, you know, you have like five pieces that you're just kind of adding slowly and I, I'm a novice, so I don't know. So please, I would like to know. I only can do one project at a time. I, I really admire people who can do several, sure. um, but I'm, I get so emotionally invested in the books that I'm writing that I think that that would be very hard for me to switch and compartmentalize. Sure. Um, that said, I, I dabble with poetry, but it's not good. It's not good, but sometimes it helps me get out of my, out of my head a little bit. But that's all subjective, isn't it? Are you writing to a, a, a certain poetic form or are you just free forming it? I, I, and again, I ask as a novice. Um, I, I'm a, I, I just like to write poetry as it comes because I don't show it to anyone. There's no pressure. So I can write whatever, however, it's, it's like playing for me. Sure. Um, and I think that that's important for writers to still have especially when we're professionals and we have to write to a deadline and there's a lot of pressure, we need to allow ourselves to play with the form too mm. so that we remember how much we love it and, and how enjoyable it can be. So I mean, when you, I, I, my, my mind keeps going back to this contracts and I've always heard things like, you know, write 500 words a day. Do you have like a limit that you have to do every day? You know, like it's gotta be a thousand words, 2000 words, something like that, or just, as far as it'll take you, I mean. It, I don't, I, I don't write to a, a word limit um, or a goal like that. My goal is more of, I would like to write this particular scene today or um, this many chapters today. I think for me, the word count, I did do the word count goal for several years. I've done the NaNoWriMo, which is oh, the yeah. novel writing month. Sure, sure. I've done, I've, I've done that three times, I think. Um, but I, when I do that, I write, so I just throw the words out on the page and then it, it creates a lot of work in revision okay. where as how I write now, I'm writing and revising as I go. And then it, if I slow my pace down, it comes out a lot cleaner. I just want to follow up on that. When you say you you have a scene that you want to write, so do you have a book mapped out in your mind from the beginning, or, or you know? And I I apologize if I'm I'm, I'm you know free forming my questions, but I, I'm really interested in that. Do you do you have it mapped out in your mind? Like I know the story will go like this, or just how the story takes you organically along? Uh, there's a little bit of both, actually. Okay. Um, I I know certain things that I have a list of and I call it must happens. And so I write down a list. These are things that have to happen in order for, you know, this has to happen so that this happens so that this happens. Sure. Um, and, and I don't plan exactly, you know, to the minuscule detail what's going to happen. But um, like today, I woke up and I knew what would need to happen in what I wrote today. Sure. And so, so that's that's kind of how I did. I'm not one that, that outlines and and plans everything. Although there are some people that swear by that. That's not worked for me in my process. No, I'm not a planner at all. So I fully understand. So that's good. Let me ask you a question. So reading your book, I mean, there was a lot of research I felt that went into your book. What kind of research? Being a librarian, I, I'm interested in that for sure. But what kind of research did you have to do for all manner of things? Uh, the research was so much fun for that uh -huh. book. Um, well, not the war part. The war part was grueling. And I did utilize my library, Kent District Library, quite often. Oh, nice. Okay. To, yeah, to find some books about the Vietnam War. Um, 
that part was really devastating to read. And I read more than I put into the book, of course. Um, but so I read a lot of books. I don't even know how many books now I read. Um, and I listened to all kinds of music from the era, made my kids listen to it. Now they're big 60s music fans. Nice. Um, I watched a lot of television shows that they would have watched then. YouTube has so many resources. Okay. But the, the part that was really great is that there are a lot of people who grew up in that era who are willing to talk mm. about it. And so I talked to my mom, you know, about fashion and music and what it was like to, to be home while people she knew were over in Vietnam. Right. I, I talked to my dad a little bit, but then my dad wrote his memoir of his time serving in Vietnam. Okay. And that was fascinating. Just all of the things that I didn't know before about his life. So I wasn't just researching for the novel, I was researching family history. Um, and so just having people that I could actually talk to in person was fantastic. And it gave, it gave so much more life to the novel than I could have given it having been born after that time. Same here. Uh, let me let me ask you a question. You know, setting because I live in West Michigan. I've lived in West Michigan a long time. I know you're originally from Lansing, but being a resident of and patron of Kent District Library, I mean, I definitely got a sense of place. And I, I the one thing I want to ask is, I kept trying to guess which town it was. Now, uh, I won't lie to you, the musical fountain definitely gave it away. But I was kind of like, but that's not. It doesn't feel all Grand Haven to me. So no. is it an amalgamation of towns? Yes. It's um, a little bit of Ludington. Okay. <laughs> mixed in with a, right. li a little bit of Holland because of the Dutch stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and so just kind of like I took the lakeshore and kind of compressed it. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, I like to write my towns as fictional towns. Um, mm -hmm just because I can, I can do that. I can pick and choose different cultural and, and um, environmental aspects of Michigan and, and just kind of push it together. Um, I, when I was a kid, I was telling my husband, we, we never went to Grand Haven or Holland or anything because we just went right to Ludington because that's where I have family. Okay. And, and those memories of, of how wild it was, it was a little bit more wild than it is now in the eighties. Okay. And just those memories are so distinct. And every time I go to Ludington, it, I, it takes me right back to how it was when I was a kid. So you compress West Michigan. How important is West Michigan? I mean, obviously to this book, but is it a setting that you use in other books as well? Because I definitely got a, a very, definitive sense of place and that, that Dutch thing you talk about. I worked in Holland for a number of years, so I get that. But I mean, how, how important is the setting for you? The setting is very important, um, particularly to that book because it, it informed so much of how the characters developed. Um, the, for those who, who aren't familiar with, with the West Michigan Dutch culture, it is strong. Yeah. Um, I had the privilege of sitting down with three generations of a family, a, a, a woman who immigrated from the Netherlands after World War II and sure. her children and one of her grandchildren. And just how, how strong their cultural identity is and, um, you know, her, her children were born here, but they spoke Dutch until they went to to kindergarten <laughs> because there were so many people in their neighborhood who spoke Dutch that they just didn't they didn't know that they were supposed to learn English sure. um, and it just it it's so that that part was very important to get that right and I'm not Dutch um, but I've got a lot of friends who are and they okay. were very very happy to tell me about the cookies their grandma's made and yeah. um, 
the little phrases that their grandpas would say and, and different things like that. And there is just something about West Michigan. There just is. It's beautiful and um, just a community is strong and, and unified. I think we saw that a few weeks ago after the protests in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. how, how, you know, devastating it was to watch some of the, the, um, the violence after there was a peaceful protest and then there was, there was the secondary event and the destruction. But then the next morning, seeing people from our community go and, mm -hmm. and clean up and paint murals where the glass was broken. It's, it's just, there's something about that, that, that I wanted to capture and the focus on, on, um, on taking care of each other is really important, especially in this book. You know, you, you talk about the compression and, and the capturing of the character. For some reason in your book, the one character who stands out in my mind, I have to ask you about characters and I, and I know we have a set of questions and I'll get to them, I promise. But as I talk to you, it makes me think, the owner of the diner, where the main character works, like, did you base this on real people or do you compress different people you know into one character? For some reason, that diner owner just stuck with me of all the characters in your book. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, he wasn't a main character, but for some reason, I, he had some advice he gave to the girl eventually. But do you, do you base it on just one singular person or do you have a group of people that you just bring into in a composite? You know what I mean? It, it, it depends on the character. So Bernie, Bernie Jagger is, yeah. is Bernie Steiner, yeah. and he, he is definitely a composite. So he's, um, he is a little bit of a boss that I had when I was in college who was just kind of grumpy. And, um, but so nice, but grumpy. You know, his, his roughness was how he showed his love. And a little bit of my, my literature professor from college, and then a little bit of um, my friend Chris, who actually is a woman, but she is she's one of those not no nonsense, loyal to the end type people. So Bernie is is definitely a compression of several people, okay. and I loved writing him. He was such a joy to write. Oh, he. he um, I will say that. Joel Jacobson is actually a person. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Okay. Um, he's he's one of the music leaders at my church. And as I was I was I was writing the story, it was originally just Annie and Mike, the two, the brother and sister. And then I thought, this family needs a teddy bear. And I looked across the room and I saw my friend Joel, and he's a teddy bear. And I thought, they need a Joel. And so I rewrote a lot of things to add that character in and i'm so glad i did nice so let me ask you um which writers do you read to help you you know or that inspire you like who do you find yourself going to when you when you want to go read a book and, and you know that you really look forward or look up to reading you know i i think that that the reason that i have grown as a writer is because i read a lot um, so there are a lot of authors that I, I go to, um, John Steinbeck definitely nice. formed a lot of, of how I, how I see the world of literature. And I went through a, a period where I just wrote like John Steinbeck for a long time. And that's fine because it, it does help you build some chops. Um, I, oh goodness. I'm looking at my bookshelf, trying to remember all the people. Lately, um, the Delia Owens, who wrote "Where the Crawdads Sing," okay, um, wow, that reading that book, it definitely fed my my writer girl soul and um, made me want to be a better writer. Oh goodness, there are so many. I think of. Oh, this is such a hard question because you have oh, to narrow it down. <laughs> but um, I really admire Wendell Berry oh, and um, Leif, Leif Unger um, is a big one for me. Uh, goodness, so many. And, and recently I've, I've been reading a lot of um, Colton Whitehead. 
and and I I can't I can't write like that, but like um, the Underground Railroad, how it's how it's just so out of the box, but it really gets my mind spinning in a different way. And so I think that going outside my genre really helps me to to hone my own taste and my own skills. Nice, nice. I read a lot of Steinbeck when I was younger. Amazing author. Do you feel you take anything from Steinbeck at all into your books? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wrote a book about the Dust Bowl because of Steinbeck. Really? <laughs> I did. Yeah, that is my one non-Michigan novel. <clears throat> um, when I was 17, I read The Grapes of Wrath, as you do, and and from then on, I was completely obsessed with the Dust Bowl, read everything I possibly could about it. And one day I looked at my husband and I said, I think I'm going to write a Dust Bowl novel. And he said, it's about time. So um, that, the way that he, he describes things is just so rich. Mm. And um, the focus on, on people and how they relate to nature and and how we treat each other and and all of that it's just so it's so strong and it, it really did form who i am as a writer so let me ask this book all manner of things how did you get the idea for this book you know that's some of my books i'm able to say this moment i got the idea i really don't know <laughs> I don't know what this one that's fair this one it kind of formed organically um I I wanted to write a story about a girl who who was growing up in the 60s and then it all just came tumbling down as I was writing the story all of this um the storyline and the characterization and everything just kind of just fit into place it's I hate to say it, but it was the easiest book I've ever written. <laughs> and um, they're not all that easy. <laughs> so how long did this take you? Like uh, from start to finish, how long do you think? Um, from the time I started researching until I turned it into my editor, I think probably a year and a half. Okay. Okay. Very good. Let me ask, um, is there a theme that you would say that runs through this book? Is there something that you really wanted to impart? You know, uh, uh, I guess theme is the word I'll use. Is, is, is there something that really runs through this book for you? I think hope. I think hope really, it's, it's a strong theme in this book that um, even in the midst of a confusing time, because mm -hmm. the 60s were extremely confusing, even in a time of, of family upheaval, and um, anxiety and loss, we can we can be people that have hope. That does not take away the sting of suffering of um, of any of that that bad stuff in our lives. But it gives us it gives us motivation and the strength to take another step and to keep going. And um, and actually that 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 theme kind of works its way into almost everything I write. Okay. Um, because I'm a person who needs a lot of hope to keep going. And, um, and I think particularly now, uh, a lot of us need that. A lot of us need that, um, that reminder that things can get better. And even though it's hard and even though it's, it's uncertain, we can have hope that Things are going to even out eventually. Very nice. So let me ask, running on to that question, would you define your work as inspirational fiction then? I mean, was this something that, you know, some libraries will put their books in the inspirational section. Do you think your book would be there or do you think it's more universal in theme? You know, that is a question I've been asking myself for seven years <laughs> about everything. Um, do I sit in, you know, in, um, in the inspirational section at Barnes and Noble, uh -huh. or um, and and I that's where I'm placed. Uh, all of my books end up in that section. So I I think that it's inspirational. 
because of the publishers that I'm with. And, um, but taking it another step, I, I hope that it inspires in some way. So I don't know that, that someone who, who doesn't go to church, I don't think that they would pick up the book and be like, oh, this isn't for me. Um, at least that's what I hope. Um, but I also think that someone that does go to church a lot could pick it up and not feel like it wasn't for them too. So I feel like I'm kind of in an in-between spot. Okay. And, and I like it there. I, I do. Um, I want to reach as many readers as I can. Sure. Let me ask, what was the hardest experience of writing this book? Like what, what was the hardest part of that experience? <sighs> um, I think the hardest part was the emotional toll that it took. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that uh, there's a, there's, I read a lot with a lot of emotion. I'm a very emotional person. Um, but even for months after I was done writing it, I still felt very connected to the characters and I felt very burdened for what they went through, not because they were my characters, but because I know that their story was very common in the 60s and very common during any wartime. And, um, and so I think that that's, that was the most difficult part for me. So obviously it took you a year and a half. It's probably been what, two years since you finally got the final into the publisher. And now here we are in Black Lives Matter and the pandemic, I mean, another time to this time. How do you feel this whole pandemic and Black Lives Matter really, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound glib about it, but almost dovetails into your book because you definitely, I mean, it feels very timely and I'm not going to try to give away the plot in any way, but right. Black Lives Matter, and then this whole tumultuous period with politics and the pandemic, do you feel your book dovetailing into that somehow? Like it was timely in that way? I can't remember exactly who it was that said that um, history doesn't repeat, but it echoes or something like that. I've never heard um, it, but that's good. I, I, I can't take credit <laughs> for that one. I think it was, it was someone much smarter than I. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, but I think that right now we are seeing a lot of echoes in history, um, you know, from history. We're seeing a lot of, of social unrest like we did in the 60s. We're seeing um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for equality is much, much um, similar to the civil rights movement. Um, a lot of, of the riots that we're seeing are similar to the race riots that happened in 1967. Sure. Um, another Michigan notable book, Aaron Bartle's We Hope for Better Things, touched as more on the um, Detroit riots of 1967. Um, we actually have an interview. I, hi I highly recommend that book. And we actually have an interview with her on Thursday of this week. So. Oh, good. Yeah, we're friends. We're good friends. So good. It, it was really exciting to see both of our books on there. But, um, but but we're seeing a lot of a lot of similarities. We're seeing a lot of of um, on the brink of massive change. Um, you know, even with the sexual revolution from the '60s, we're seeing some of that too with um, some of the discussions about LGBTQ. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of echoes. And um, I guess two years ago, I was talking to to one of my professors. Um, and I said, it's just a weird time. And he said, there are a lot of weird times in history, and this is one of them, and we will make it through. And I think that that's, that's something that we're on the cusp of something. And, and there is just so much going on, though, right now that it's hard to, to see the, the long term story of this. But as someone who loves history, I can see that there are waves, there are ebbs and flows in history, and and I have a lot of hope um, that that we will overcome, and and we just need to be caring for each other. We need to be thinking of other people, not just ourselves, and we need to to be leaning in and trying to learn. Mm -hmm. And this is a it's a very important time for us not to say, well, I disagree, so you're wrong. It's a very important time for us to say, tell me more. And, um, and I, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to learn and it's not easy and it's, 
it's provoking, but um, it's so important because if we're going to love our neighbors well, that's what we need to do. So let me ask, I mean, what's that doing to your writing process right now? I mean, obviously you do a lot of research for your writing. So is it changing the way you research? Is it just changing the way you're writing? Is it changing what you're writing about? <clears throat> you know, I, I signed a contract for the book I'm currently writing, um, gosh, a year ago. Okay. And so I, I'm locked in for what I'm writing. And it's, it's, it's the kind of book that, I was, I was afraid to write. And, um, and I, I think that this, this whole current um, everything is, is kind of fueling me to want to, to reach out to readers so that maybe they'll experience something that's different from what they're used to. Um, so it's not changing what I'm writing, but I think it's changing how I'm writing it. Mm. Um, maybe with a little more empathy, um, with a lighter hand, because I think right now heavy handedness is not going to help anybody. <laughs> um, and, and just with a little more compassion for myself, because writing right now is, is difficult. Um, cause our brains are so consumed with so many other things. Right. Um, but, I am so grateful for my publisher, my editor, who are very compassionate and and very, very understanding of of what all is going on. Um, also, we will be utilizing a sensitivity reader for this book just to make sure that I don't cause any harm um, unintentionally. And I think that that's important. Wow. So... That leads me to a question about, I mean, who, who does the reading through of your books before they're published? Like all manner of things. Who was the first one? Was it your husband? Did you have friends? My editor. Your editor. <laughs> um, I, I'm very, I hold what I'm writing very close until after my editor reads it. Okay. Um, because I, you know, in the early days of, of me writing novels, I had a lot of people read it before it went to my editor. And, you know, there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen and they had good advice, but it, it wasn't all for that piece or, um, you know, it was, or it was discouraging or something like that. And so this is where my, my relationship of trust with my editor is very important. And, um, I'm so grateful for her and for the other, I work with several editors along the way and they are, they're amazing. So have you had the same publisher and editor all the way through? Is it done the same person? It hasn't. No, I've been with three different publishers over my career. Okay. And um, I am very happy to say that I have been fortunate in, the, in who I've gotten to work with. I, okay. I have no complaints. Very nice. So your title, has it always been that, all manner of things? Has it always been all manner of things? And if not, what's the significance of all manner of things? <laughs> You know, with um, with some publishers, they they have a meeting to discuss the title of books. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I suggest some ideas, sure. and then they come back and say, "Well, this is the one we landed on." <clears throat> so sorry. And with this particular novel, I had no clue what it could be, and and I turned in all of my ideas, and then about a week later, I was reading a quote by Julian of Norwich, who was um, a, a mystic in, oh, forever ago, a very, very, like hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And she, she had visions and, and different things like that. Very interesting. Um, her writing is very interesting. And in one of them, she has this quote that is everybody who has ever heard of her knows this quote. It's, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And when I read that, I thought, ah, oh, that's exactly what this, this family and this story needs to hear, is that all shall be well. <clears throat> and so I emailed the publisher and I said, can I add one more idea? And it was all manner of things, and they grabbed it. And, and ran with it. And I'm so glad they did yeah. because, because it, it really has, it, it defines the book so well for me. 
are there specific parts or pieces of the book that really are your favorites? Are there characters that are your favorites uh, in this book? You know, I, this book has a lot of my all-time favorite characters I've ever written. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but if I were to narrow it down, Mike, um, the big brother of the protagonist, is definitely the kind of character that you want you want to know. You want to know him. Sure. Um, and Gloria, uh, there's a lot of my mom in Gloria, okay. um, kind of the, the strong woman who has it all together. And the scene for Gloria that's my favorite, and I'm not going to say too much about it because I want people to experience it, sure. but it involves a meatloaf. <laughs> okay. And that scene was so fun to write. Um, but I think that of all the characters I've written, all the protagonists I've written over my career, the one I have identified with the most is Annie, who is the protagonist of this book. She's um, particularly when I was that age, um, very um, shy. I, I, you know, I was a little more shy then, but I pretended not to be, and um, and just introspective and and wants wants the best for people and I, I really identify with her in so many ways very nice very nice so let me ask you were selected as a Michigan notable book author for this year what did that mean what, how did that feel when you were you, you got the word that you were selected first of all I did not believe it I was like really mm, I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know because <laughs> um, it just it was such a surprise okay and I I couldn't speak and I just, I, my own, my husband wasn't home from work yet when I got the message and I turned to my daughter who was, who was, had just turned 13 at the time. And I was like, um, um, this thing, <laughs> I just could not articulate. Um, I remember sending you that email, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I was, I'm so, and I just was like, all right, don't freak out when you write back try to seem a little normal. <laughs> okay. um, but what it means to me, eh, Michigan is so much of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, being a Michigander is, you know, I, oh, I just love our state so much. It, it, it's beautiful and wild and a culture and, and, and so varied and vast. And, um, and we were just in the UP last week and I just, Oh, amazing. Right. But not the black flies. The black flies are wicked. <laughs> um, but yes, they are. Yeah. So, and then, and then, so that being recognized by my home state was just so powerful. And then to be recognized by the library system that got me through childhood and taught me so much was where I you know, in Lansing, I'd go and check out as many books as they'd let me and, and just having the resources. So two of the things that I've loved so much, um, joining together and, and saying your book has merit. It was, it was, I was breathless. It was just such an honor for me. Well, and I can tell you the committee, yours was a very quick selection. I, I do remember that, quite frankly. I, I, I do remember, and the committee was 13 people made up of, of people, librarians and writers from around the state, really from Detroit all the way to Zealand. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a quick selection. There was, there was not much uh, debate when it came to your work. So, and we thank you for writing it. And we're glad that your publisher submitted it to the, the Notable Book Selection Committee. Well, and I had no idea that <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> um, I thank you so much for telling me that. That's very encouraging. And, um, you know, it's just, I, I told my husband, I, I don't, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an actress, and I don't know that winning an Oscar would be this cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because it's, you know, it's such a, to me, it was such a huge deal. And then having to keep it a secret for so long was grueling. Sorry. But then when, no, it's, it's, no, it was great, because then it was revealed in a newspaper. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. 
So let me ask you, I got I to gotta ask you a question about this because you're one of the authors and it's always hard. So we always, when we have a normal year, we put authors around the state. And to be frank and not anything against the UP, but it's hard to get people up to the UP. But I do remember last winter when I asked people, where would you be willing to go? And you definitely were like, yeah, the UP. And then you talked about, I was up in the UP uh, this past weekend. What is it about the UP for you? What do you love it about up there so much? You know, first of all, right now, it's the best social distance vacation you can take because there's <laughs> nobody up there. Um, but you know, when I was a kid, um, we went up to Copper Harbor a few times, and that's for anybody that's that's not familiar. That is as far as you can go. Yep. And um, you know, there's something about the wild nature of the UP, just miles and miles of of trees and yeah. bears and. Um, it's, just and so it's, it's not like you just crossed the bridge either, because I remember specifically you were like, oh, no, I'm, I'm closer to Wisconsin. And I'm thinking, whoa, that's quite a trip. So, I mean, you do that a lot because, I mean, it's like another four or five hours after the bridge, right? We hadn't with, since our kids were born. Um, we wanted them to be older so that they could they could really go on a hike, you know, yeah, sure. and and really experience that. And, and um, because on those UP hikes, you're in, you're invested. You're not going, there's no turning back. Like the parking lot's really far away. No park um, or anything. And we, we actually, last week we did pictured rocks and that 10 mile hike felt like 50. Sure. sure. <laughs> but, um, but I'll tell you, it is every black fly bite, every fall in the mud, every, every, all of it was worth it to stand on Lake Superior and see the the water and and the tree growing out of a rock and just the the, the just enormity of, of what we have in this state is it, it's startling. I remember when I was a kid and I went to the ocean for the first time. I was like, okay, it was like like Michigan. So I mean, it's, it's here in our home state. So when when um i was selected to to speak at a up library i was like oh that's our vacation we're we're going up and we're going to spend time and we didn't we didn't um cancel our rsvp because i was just like let's just do it sure. um and i think that, that that's one of the great things about michigan you can drive eight hours mm -hmm. and see something incredible that that will blow your mind that it's it's in our own state Right. Very nice. So finishing up, tell me, why do you think somebody should read your book, All Manner of Things? Why do you think somebody should sit down, invest their time to read your book, All Manner? Obviously, it's a notable book winner, but why do you think personally somebody should read All Manner of Things? You know, I, I think that, that if you sit down and read it, you're going to find a character that either you identify with or that you know somebody like them. Um, and I think that it will touch people's hearts and it might, it might help them to, to grow in empathy for maybe what their parents lived through in the 60s mm. or what people are living through now. And, um, and it just, it, it's, it really is a love, love letter to Michigan in a lot of ways, especially West Michigan. Well, Susie, thank you so much. That was a lovely ending right there. So thank you. And to everyone, again, All Manner of Things by Susie Finkbeiner, uh, Revell Press. Um, again, this is the 2020 Michigan Notable Book uh, Award winner, All Manner of Things. And uh, please check it out at your local library or bookstore. And again, thank you to our friends from the Library of Michigan Foundation. And just remember that we will be having more of these uh, conversations uh, recorded with our 2020 Michigan Notable Book Award winners very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Thank you so much.